All right, it is Wednesday at about 2.15 in the afternoon, and I've got your second part of Ancient Greece in this video here. Um, there's two things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what's called the Hellenic world, which is classic Athens, what we really think about when we talk about Ancient Greece, and the Hellenistic world, which is the time of Alexander the Great. So let's talk first about the Helena, uh, Hellenic world, the classic age. And this is kind of going to be the same time as what I was talking about last class. This is before the, the Athens is beaten by Sparta. This is before the Peloponnesian world. This is really kind of what we think of when we think of Greece. Uh, first thing though, um, this is the time period where the idea of history really starts. Was history being made before that? Yes, of course. But it was not a discipline. It wasn't seen as something academic. And the ancient Greeks, specifically people from Athens, are going to change that. And there's two names that you should know. Whether you're going to go on to be a history major or not, there are two very important names to know. One is a guy named Herodotus. Herodotus is considered the father of history, and he wrote about the Persian War. The other guy you should know, his name is Thucydides, and Thucydides wrote about the Peloponnesian War. What made these two guys so different from everybody else is that when they wrote their books, when they wrote their stories, they focused on what people did and how people interacted with each other and what the actions of people brought. Others before these two guys, when they wrote, they talked about Greek gods a lot. Like Zeus coming down to earth, throwing an arrow or a lightning bolt and hitting somebody in the face with it, and that's why Johnny won the war. No, that's not what Herodotus and Thucydides did. They took out the gods and just focused on what humans did to humans. And because of that, this is considered the birth of the historical discipline. We have Athenian architecture, and I've got two pictures here. The picture at the top right, that is the famous Parthenon. That's where the temple to Athena Nike is. And the bottom is the Propylaea, which was the entrance to the Acropolis. Now, all of this was built by a guy named Pericles. Uh, Pericles ruled Athens for about 20 years. He was the leader of Athens, and Athens was in one of those leagues, one of those federations called the Delian League. And what Pericles would do is a lot of that money that came in from the, the allies of Athens that was meant for their security and their defense, Pericles would actually kind of steal and use to pay for the construction of all these great big buildings. And Pericles, he would build all these temples, all these public buildings, all these theaters, and he is the main reason that Athens is the city that we think of today. Most famous is the Acropolis. Remember the Acropolis is a defendable hill in the middle of the town. And the Acropolis of Athens is the most famous Acropolis in the world. That's where you find the Parthenon. It's where you find the Temple of Athena Nike, the Temple of Zeus, uh, the Propylaea. Uh, at the base of the Acropolis is the Theater of Dionysus, which was a theater that could hold 9,000 participants, spectators, audience members, whatever you want to call them. And speaking of theater, the people of Athens, they loved their theater. And I've got some pictures of, or a picture of some Athenian theater masks. They're pretty interesting looking. But theater in Athens was kind of considered the national pastime. And there were large plays. These plays were held at, comp or these plays were in competition. These competitions were done in these festivals. Very often, these festivals were day-long or week-long festivals. They're held annually outdoors. There are different contests, and the winners get different things. And a lot of the early plays were based on fertility, and that shows in the double meanings in the, in the frankly, obscenities that are in the original works. There are very few props. There are only two to three actors on stage with speaking parts. 
And the way you played different roles was you held up one of these different masks in front of your face, and that showed what character you were being at that time. Chorus was also very important to Athenian theater, and it was considered a civic duty if you were wealthy enough to participate in the chorus. And then there were two real types of drama, if you will. There was the tragedy, which meant goat song, and it was called that because the winner of the tragedy competition would win a goat. And then there was the comedy, and a comedy, it's based on the word komos singing, which was basically drunken singing. Ancient Greek philosophy, there's four things you need to know here. First one are the sophists. The sophists, they come before Socrates. Uh, they didn't want to speculate. They ignored the physical world around them, and they only taught the skills of persuasion and rhetoric. If you have had public speaking at West Georgia Tech, if you've had any of uh, Mrs. Kirk's classes, you've learned some rhetoric and you've learned some persuasion. Uh, these are skills that were used in business and used in government, things that could basically get you ahead. And the sophists, they charged you a lot of money for these. Socrates, on the other hand, he didn't take any pay for his teachings. Uh, he said, I can only teach you what I know. I cannot teach you anything that I don't know. And if I tried to teach you something I don't know, then I would be a fool. He used something called the dialectic method, which is today also called the Socratic method. And basically what he would do is he would keep asking questions and ask questions and ask questions and really get you to think, well, why am I saying this? Am I saying this because I believe it or am I saying this because it's the truth? And by continually questioning your beliefs and continuing to make you think and look inside yourself, he hoped to get you to use reason instead of just repetition, culture, expectations. Uh, Plato was a student of Socrates, and he saw wisdom as a science. And he said, you can gain wisdom through training, through intelligence, and through education. Uh, he was not a big fan of just everyday people. He said only those who truly understood are those that have enough intelligence. He, uh, Plato, he didn't really like democracy and said he said uh, he believed that a benevolent dictator or an enlightened despot was the best way to keep control. And then you got Aristotle. Aristotle is a student of Plato, and Aristotle, he looks at what Socrates taught, and he looks at what Plato talks, and he kind of adapts that to his personal belief. Uh, Aristotle's going to say, there's no such thing as a perfect state. There's no such thing as a utopia. So the next best thing we can do is create the best state possible. Aristotle also believed that humans are social creatures, social animals, and that the city or the polis is the natural habitat for humans. Just like Plato and just like Socrates, he was not a big fan of democracy either. All right, we also have to talk for a moment about women, a group called medics and slaves. So let's start with women. Women, they had no political power and they had very little public power and they're basically perpetual minors. In any economic transaction, any legal transaction, they're always represented by a male family member. It could be a father, husband, male relative. There's a Greek saying, and I'm not making this up, that describes different type of women like this. We have prostitutes for the sake of pleasure, concubines for daily care of the body, and wives for the purpose of begetting a legitimate, legitimate children and having a reliable garden for the guardian for the contents of the house. So that gives you an idea of where women rank in Athenian society. <clears throat> Girls are sheltered throughout their childhood because they're supposed to remain pure. Women are usually married at puberty around the age of 13 because they're still seen as pure at that time. Their husband, more often than not, is around 30 years old. 
and the marriages are arranged by men. The young 13-year-old woman has no say in it. Another thing, marriages between cousins were often favored. Now that sounds pretty gross, and it is. From, on a biological standpoint, there's enough genetic diversity where severe defects are unusual, but it's still pretty gross. So why did they do it? Why did they keep it in the family, so to say? And so that they could keep family wealth together. Women also had a dowry, that's D-O-W-R-Y. Basically, when a woman gets married, she brings some money into the marriage with her. And if for some reason a divorce happens, or if the marriage is split, that money goes back with the woman to her next marriage. Which, by the way, the second marriage is arranged as well. After a child is born, that becomes the woman's primary goal is to keep that child alive. And if a woman fails to produce a child, it's always the woman's fault. It's never the man's fault, and it is grounds for divorce. Medics, those are non-citizens of Athens. Basically, if you're an outsider, if you are somebody from another city-state, you can come to Athens if you have a sponsor, but only if somebody will sponsor you. Once you are in Athens, you are required to serve in the military, you're required to pay taxes, but you're not a citizen of Athens. You cannot vote in elections, you cannot participate in politics. Now a big question is why do these medics come to Athens if they still have to work in the military but get none of the benefits of citizenship? It's because life in Athens was that much better and they had a chance to make enough money to, for it to be worth their problem. Slaves, very few rights. Slaves work in almost any occupation. They could be simple laborers, they could be skilled craftsmen, they could even be prostitutes. A slave could be forced to work in whatever occupation the owner thought would make them money. <clears throat> All right, moving on to Alexander the Great, and this is known as the Hellenistic world. And I've got a uh, picture of Alexander the Great right there for you. And this is going to be what happens after the Peloponnesian War, after Sparta beats Athens. Sparta beats Athens with the help of a couple of allies. The biggest allies are Corinth and Thebes. Well, after a couple of years, Corinth and Thebes have a falling out with Sparta, and they both declare war on Sparta. Uh, Sparta is going to be defeated at the Battle of Electra, and for the next 60 years or so, Greece is going to be one big civil war. One city-state or one league is going to get power. Other city-states, other leagues are going to fight them and, and get rid of that power, and it's just a big mess. While all this is going on, there's this guy named Philip of Macedonia who's in far north Greece who's just watching it and waiting his turn. Um, Macedonia, the, it's a Greek-speaking area, although it's a very different dialect of Greek. Uh, when I'm in class, I, I usually try to compare this to like an English speaker here in the United States with an English speaker in South Africa or New Zealand. It's still English, but it can be very hard to understand some of the words because it's a completely different dialect. Certain words are said different, certain words are completely different, etc., etc. Well, this is the same thing. It's still Greek, but it's a different way of speaking Greek. The Macedonians are also considered borderline barbarians because when they drank their wine, they drank it undiluted, which was seen as uncivilized. The Macedonians have a very, very military-based culture, and Philip of Macedonia is going to adopt some of the military improvements that are used in the Battle of Lectra and use them for his own advantage. For example, the original hoplites could be only like middle-class farmers. Philip of Macedonia says, Whatever. If you want to be a hoplite, come join me. The spears are going to go from 9 foot to 12 feet long. And then there's going to be a cavalry as well. And in Macedonian warfare, the cavalry is more important than the phalanx. What happens is the cavalry 
lines up in this wedge shape, runs through the enemy's phalanx, and then Macedonia's, or Philip of Macedonia's foot soldiers come on and just kind of finish up the job. Now, Philip is going to conquer most of Greece. Uh, there's the Battle of Sharona in 328 BC that pretty much says, I rule all of you. The only part of Greece that Philip really didn't conquer was Sparta because he didn't think it was worth it. Now, Philip of Macedonia, uh, you know, he's pretty powerful, but he also makes a lot of enemies. And Philip of Macedonia is going to be murdered. We don't know who murders him. He was very arrogant. He was a womanizer. He had four wives, a couple dozen mistresses. And it's thought that one of the husbands of, his, of a mistress murdered him. But no matter how he died, his death is going to be Alexander's gain. Alexander III is better known as Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great is one of the best known people in history. Alexander the Great is going to inherit the throne at the age of 20. I'm sure some of you out there listening to this are 20 years of age right now. And he is going to go in the next 13 years and become the ruler of the entire known world. Now, Alexander the Great, he loved science. He was a student of Aristotle. He was a man of the military. He had run his dad's cavalry since he, he was 18. Uh, he was extremely ruthless to his enemies, but he lived with his soldiers, and his soldiers loved him. Well, in 334 BC, he invades Persia. He starts at the city of Troy, where he sacrifices an animal, and he says, I'm a new Greek god. His reason for invading Persia is revenge for those invasions by Darius and Xerxes that happened hundreds of years before. Um, by 332 BC, he has conquered all of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. He's conquered Palestine, which is going to be like Syria, Lebanon, and, and Israel, and Jordan. And he's going to invade and conquer Egypt. And by the way, when he's in Egypt, he's also going to say, I'm a Greek god too, and an Egyptian god at the same time. 330 BC, he's going to conquer Assyria, which is today parts of Jordan and parts of Iraq. And then by 326, he's going to conquer Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Around the year 326, his army basically says, you know what, we want, we want to go home, we're not going any further. And Alexander the Great says, okay, and turns the army around and starts to head back towards home. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, some of you have, there's a scene in there where Forrest Gump is running and he just says, I think I'll go home now, and turns around and starts walking home. That's what I always think of when I when Alexander the Great and his army. But anyways, when he gets to the city of Babylon in 323 BC, he dies, and his death is kind of mysterious. We don't know why. There are three theories. One is poisoning. One is just bad health, and one is that he drank himself to death. Of those three, we just don't know which one is right. Now, Alexander leaves a pretty big legacy. One legacy is Alexander liked to sleep with women, and there are entire villages that can trace their lineage back to Alexander the Great. But beyond that, he also left a son, but the son is very young, and his generals push him out of power. And then the three generals fight over Alexander's body, and they fight over Alexander's empire. His general Antigonus gets Macedonia, which is Greece. Seleucus gets Syria and Western Asia and begins the Seleucid Empire. And then Ptolemy gets Egypt, which was the real prize. And the city of Alexandria is established the Great Library of Alexandria is opened, and it's very likely that Ptolemy was able to take Alexander's body and bury it in the city of Alexandria, but Alexander's body has never been found. All right, so that's all about Alexander the Great. Now, before I tell you about Hellenistic life, here is your secret word of the day. 
The secret word of the day is court. C O U R T. Yesterday, the Supreme Court made a important ruling that affects many, many people. So today's secret word is court. C O U R T. Okay, the Hellenistic world, Hellenistic life. What's different from this compared to earlier Greek culture? Number one, Alexandria is going to become the center of Greek culture. That's significant because Alexandria is not in Greece. It is in Egypt. So Egypt is really the home of Greek culture under Alexander the Great and beyond. There's no more independent city-states. There's no more independent polis. All the cities have been united in a kingdom. So they're not independent, but they're still important trading centers. They are still important political centers. Hellenistic cultures focused on the private life, where Hellenic culture was more on, on the public world. So that's a big difference. Hel Hellenistic culture starts to look at the individual. Uh, women have more say. Women are present in literature. Um, it becomes okay for people to show their feminine side, if you will. And Hellenistic women get some political status and some legal status, although not very much. And then possibly the most important thing is Greek culture spreads all around the world. It spreads all the way from Spain to India. And Greek ideas go, Greek religion goes, and Greek language goes too. I also have three Hellenistic philosophies for you. There's the Cynics. Uh, they reject all conventions of society. Cynics believe that happiness is best found when you satisfy your own needs, and the best way to satisfy your own needs is to live a life of simplicity. You also have the Epicureans, who were founded by a guy named Epicurus, and they only trusted what they could see, what they could sense, what they could feel, what they could touch, what they could hear. They only relied on their senses. And they thought the key to life was to withdraw from life. They thought you could be happy by living like a hermit. They didn't think there was any life after death because they didn't think you could see a soul. And because you couldn't see a soul, they didn't think there was really any purpose in life other than just existing. Then you also have the Stoics. The Stoics are founded by Zeno. And a Stoic would say that people must live in nature and with themselves all in harmony. And they believed that there are three parts to life. There was good, which was like courage, wisdom, justice. There was evil, which was cowardice, foolishness, etc. And then there was indifference, things you couldn't control, which was your life, your health, beauty, strength, things like that. Now for me, what's the strangest about the Stoics is they thought that passion was the root of all evil. Somebody who showed too much passion, that meant that their soul was ill and they needed help. Now beyond this, there were also some mystery cults. You could find a cult for basically anything you wanted. Uh, there were cults to Dionysus. There were cults to Osiris. There were cults to the Greek or the Egyptian goddess Isis. And strangely enough, Judaism was considered one of these mystery cults as well because under Greek period of history, Judaism changes and mixes with Greek culture. And millions of Jews are going to settle throughout Greek lands. Okay, so that's that. Now a couple of other things for you to look at. You have your second reflection paper due Sunday night at midnight, and for your second reflection paper, you can use any of the India readings, any of the Chinese readings, any of the Greek readings. Remember, your first paragraph should be a short summary of what you're doing, and the next page to page and a half, double spaced, should be your thoughts, opinions, ideas, how does this make you feel, do you agree with it, disagree with it, whatever it might be. The important thing there is personal reflection, don't research, just read the article and tell me what you think about it. 
next week is your midterm exam. it will be available monday and and close on sunday so you'll have all week to do it just like normal and some other things you might want to consider doing you got museum review where you look at either the online museum where you watch one of those historical movies that's going to be due at the end of the semester but you can turn it in at any time also when i talk about the roman republic the roman empire i'm going to start also talking about your research paper between now and then, start thinking about something that we're going to cover in this class that interests you, that you're interested in learning more about. Maybe it's Hammurabi of the Babylonians, maybe it's Julius Caesar, whatever it might be. Just start thinking of a topic that you're interested in so you can begin doing some research when I tell you what to look for. All right, that is it. Make sure you get all your work done by Sunday at midnight. That's gonna be your quizzes, your discussions, and your reflection paper. Good luck studying for your midterm exam. I'll try to get you out a study guide by Saturday night or Sunday morning at the latest. And there will be no video next week. It's just your midterm exam. So I'll see you again on the 29th. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.